for all verified facts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome. The global investment climate has been a little challenging, particularly in the post-COVID-19 era. Even as capital and businesses seek new opportunities and the likelihood of setting up new supply chains across the world. So how does this really pan out for a country like India? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And how have we coped with the last six months and what's really flown in our direction? To understand this, I'm now joined by Deepak Bagla. Deepak is the Managing Director and CEO of Invest India, which is the National Investment Promotion and Facilitation Arm or Agency of the Government of India and acts as a first point of reference for investors. Uh, Deepak Bagla earlier worked in the World Bank, uh, also with Citibank Global Corporate and Investment Teams, as well as in private equity. Mr. Bagla, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, first question, what's your sense? I mean, when you look back now uh, at the last six months and uh, before, what, what, is the, what is the temperature like in terms of what are investors saying? Where are uh, investments coming up, uh, coming in or firming up? COVID. To answer that question, let me just step back a bit and let us see what happened on 31st of March this year, 2020. That is when the close of a financial year. And that's, let's say, just about seven days after the lockdown happened on the 23rd of March. So on 31st of March, 2020, we closed the year with an FDI of $74 billion. It's the highest ever FDI we've got in our history. But what's more interesting is that close to 92, 93% of the 74 billion came in the open route. That meant it did not require any specific approvals to come in. And that also means that we are now one of the most open economies on the planet with the private sector having the ability to play a role in each and every sector of my economy. What's more interesting than that also is that close to 50% of the 74 billion came in greenfield investment. Today, India is one of the top greenfield investment destinations on the planet. Now, why did this happen? So just before we went into this virus and the COVID lockdown, let us see what had been established very well in the world. It is the largest market, at least for, at least for the next 100 years, if I may say so, with a customer base of 1.5 billion. That is what we will be in the next 20, 25, 26. I don't think there'll be any other single open market within one geograph uh, one, one national boundary, which will have 1.5 billion customers in it, at least for the next 100 years. The second was it was one of the largest and the fastest growing markets. Our economy was the fastest growing large economy. That is something we're going to be looking to come back to that position very quickly. And the last part being that we were the youngest in the world, one of the youngest economies in the world, youngest societies with an average age of 29, that meant of that, of that 1.5 billion, a billion of those under the age of 35. So it was an economy which was high on customers, which was high on demand, and which was going forward and growing in that manner. And we would have remained one of the youngest economies on the planet all the way up to 2018. Very strong fundamentals which were moving those businesses to India. And that is what had created the number of 74 billion. Now let us see what happened with this virus. What this little virus has done to my mind, that it has accentuated and catalyzed a large number of trends, those underlying trends, which were already being tethered or which we were already seeing in the system, globally and in India. Let me give you an example of one of them. De-risking of business lines and supply chains was a class 101 in all economics business classes. Over the past two decades, we saw people tended to overlook that and you saw a concentration happening in certain geographic regions. What this entire COVID has brought about is the vulnerability of that concentration of supply chains. And that had already started seeing a movement when I brought that 74 billion figure. And what I'm seeing now is that getting catalyzed to a large extent. Today, the number of business requests I'm getting are substantially more than I had in the past five years of Invest India, in fact, effectively four years of Invest India. And the investor requests today are, please show us where the land is. We want to come in now and start going on. So that movement of supply chains getting onshore and those supply chains also becoming shorter. We'd also seen a world where the supply chains had become very extended. Those two elements now which are coming in are to a 
major extent seeing businesses moving to where the markets are and where the markets are meaning they're looking at India, which as I've already explained, one of the larger markets. The right. second element which comes and go with is this entire work from home thing. Now work from home essentially means work from anywhere. And to my mind, for the first time in, since our independence, I'm seeing digitization bringing India to make it one. What do I mean by that? When I say one, I mean access to opportunities, access to the benefits which the government has to offer and the entire growth which we witnessed during the past seven or decades. Today, with that digitization, and mind you, even during the COVID period, we've covered over 5,000 uh, 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 villages with the optic fiber already taken, being laid down. So it is being extended. This entire digitization effort of this government has been a huge movement and a huge success to my mind, which has created a very strong foundation for growth taking place in an inflection point manner. And what brings me to that inflection point manner is, we are now at the bottom end of the hockey stick just rounding off. With these new trends which are now taking shape and catalyzed, and India sitting so well poised to actually effectively take on these new trends in its new growth pattern and path is going to move on very quickly. And what is happening there? When I talk about this work from home and work from anywhere, what I'm saying is the other day I was sitting on a platform on one of these global platforms and I shared it with a young boy, 18 year old Rohit Kashyap from Sitam Hari in Bihar, a small district in Bihar. And you know what Rohit does? Rohit has a startup called Maitri. And what this startup does is helping startups around the villages of where he is and the cities connect to the global world, get them mentorship, see a market for their products and make it happen. The new engine of growth of India is going to move beyond the large major metros and cities to the small towns of India. The new India, as we see it now with these new fundamentals, is going to be growing bottom up and not just going to be top down. And this bottom-up growth is going to make it a far more broad-based growth, a growth which is going to be far more sustainable and at a growth which is going to be at a pace which we have not seen before. Let me give you another example. So, you know, Invest India has four verticals. The first is Investor Promotion and Facilitation. We are the National Investment Promotion Agency of the Government of India. What we work there is we work with every investor, foreign or local, helping them with their market strategy, getting them all connections, getting them approvals, getting them land and a partner, and then hand-holding their business even after it has happened. The second is Startup India. We are the execution arm of Startup okay. India. Let me take a minute on that one. You remember January 2016 is when the Honorable Prime Minister Modi launched Startup India. That means effectively what? We are 48, 50 months away from that. Look at what Startup India has done. We are number three in the world in number of unicorns today. We are number two in the world with the as far as the number of startups go, if I go by market statistics. And I'm number one in the world with new startups adding every day. India is leapfrogging. And you know what is interesting? I had one of the founders of one of the largest e firms of the world in my office just uh, towards the end of last year. And when he had come to India, he had wanted to meet a few of our startups. He had given 40 minutes to visit our office. I've been invited a few startups. He came back to my room from the conference room after four hours. He had cancelled all his other meetings. He spent time with my startups, came into my room, had invested his personal money in our startups and gave his visiting card to my startup head saying, if you have any such ideas, ask them to get in touch with me directly. He said the interesting thing of the startups of India was that they were giving me solutions which are applicable to 6 billion of the world, not just the top 500 billion. And more interestingly, solutions which were scalable, solutions which are easy to implement and execute, and solutions which were at a completely different price point, one of the most competitive price points. And that brings me to the point as to what happened during these 180 days of the virus affecting us. 
You remember on the 31st of March, we did not have a single PPE in India. There was this entire uproar as where we were going to get it, and we were all so dependent upon one or two countries in the world, because the rest of the world was closed, trying to source it from them, which was becoming extremely difficult, because the rest of the world was also aiming at those two countries or three countries to get the PPEs. From that 31st of March, where we were zero, to the 31st of July, we today have a run rate of close to a million PPEs a day. We made those ventilators which were required ourselves to the point that we are not just self-sufficient, but we are in a position we are exporting them to other countries in the world and to countries such as UK and the US, and even the quality is excellent. You know why did that happen? That was the amazing ability of my MSMEs, of my startups, which could pivot their business models in a very nimble manner, which had the best utilization of limited capital and resources, and pairing them up, which is where the invest in their team was working day and night, pairing them up with larger scale companies like auto companies or hosiery companies, and getting these PPEs out. That is the strength of India. The third part of uh, my verticals is Agni, A-G-N-I-I, which is the accelerated growth of New India Innovation, and which is uh, run out of uh, the office of the principal scientific advisor to the prime minister, and invest in there as the execution arm. What we are doing there is picking up these innovations and fast tracking them onto commercialization. And this is why I bring this in, is because this example of what happened in COVID is a brilliant example to show the ingenuity of India and what is going to power that new growth point of India. The last part about my fourth vertical is obviously a part which is what we are doing based to wealth, where we are picking up Sentinel sites in India and seeing how do we convert and bring the best in class projects and technology to see how do we convert that into wealth. Now it takes me back to what I see happening just as we get out of this virus. Think about, look at how this virus is now across the country. If you look at it, even today, and we are one of the most densely populated countries on the planet with over 1.3 billion of human resource, about 83 to 84% of this virus is still contained to six states of India out of my 28 states in numbers. So that early point of coming in and going through one of the most unprecedented lockdowns in history is helping us in that manner. One doesn't know how this virus behaves, how it changes its shape every day. But as we speak, it is now in a position where we've been able to contain it to a large extent. And we've also seen the mortality figures, which are much lower than what we've seen globally, though every life matters. What is the result which I'm seeing? And I was just looking at some August data. But before the August data, let me bring you to the July data. And you know, when I was speaking about the strength of MSMEs, and let me bring you that data. In July, and you know, there's a moratorium for all repayments, which has happened as per uh, all bank, uh, uh, as per government announcements. Even in the month of July, when it was one of the toughest months, my MSME collections, remember at a time of moratorium, my MSME collection started the month of July at 60% and ended up at 65%. It's not ended there. My microfinance collections were as high as 80%. In a time when we were the most stressed, even I'm looking at August data, let me give you a very interesting one on that one. My rail freight. Now, rail freight is very critical to show the movement of goods and freight. Movement when it is happening was at across 94.3 million tons this August, which was higher than it was last August. Even my GST numbers were close to about 88%. What am I coming to? I'm right. coming to. Yeah, go I can, I can, a couple of quick questions. Uh, you know, uh, can I put this? So, you know, we've also been, uh, you know, talking about Atman Nirbhar Bharat, which is self reliance. From what you're saying, I can also sense that uh, you're now uh, almost straddling a double role of, uh, of uh, incentivizing and encouraging local investment and enterprise. Uh, in addition to bringing in capital. So how is this uh, equation playing out or likely to play out in uh, coming days? 
So Govind, that is what I was coming to. This Atma Nirbhar thing and this concept which the Prime Minister has mentioned, I think is one of the most critical elements and foundation stones of the new India. The strength of new in India actually used to lie in our MSMEs, those 65 million MSMEs, which I mentioned to you earlier about. The strength of India was in their nimbleness and creating business models and creating solutions, both in manufacturing and otherwise, which is what were applicable to India and not just to India, but across the world. That had to be rejuvenated. That is what came back into that from the Make in India effort, which we started to see that the strengths of India in that entire manufacturing path are brought back to life. And at the same point of time, see that our dependence and especially where we have strengths and we are more competitive and competitive strengths and skills where we can create it, not just for India, but if you look at virtually all business models which are coming into India today are where they're looking at the scale which is available in India. So what happens is the scale in India gets them that ability of being competitive. And that is what helps them to take it forward and grow. For example, we had a car called a Quid, a segment A car in India, which was over 95% localized in India. It used to be made by Renault. And it is exported to over 40 countries of the world. Because it's an excellent product at an excellent price point. That is the strength of India. In fact, some of the other major multinationals, and I must bring you to a point here, that in the past 50 months, we've had over a thousand new R&D centers opened up in India by multinationals, corporations. In fact, today I'm, the num I'm rated number one in the world for multinational corporations opening their R&D centers outside of their home country. That is not just because of the skill availability. We have the best manpower and the skill available, but also right. the ability to translate that into creating those manufacturing elements. And that Govind is the one which moves into the Atma Nirbhar Bharat about getting these bottom up facilities going up and creating those centers of excellence across the country. And if you look at it, one of the big movements which has happened during the past 120 days during which we are going through COVID is the policies both by the state government and the central government, which are all focused on creating an ease of business or easing the journey of the investor in India and more importantly, creating plug and play models. You know, we have over 3,700 industrial clusters, each cluster having its specialization in a product. What the governments and more interestingly, my state governments are doing today is upgrading those clusters. So what is happening even for a global supply chain to move in or even for my local MSMEs, they will come in and move into that plug and play model they can start much easier. Not only is it going to be easier to start their businesses where it will be a better utilization of capital, but also because of the ecosystem available there, they will be able to do it in a far more competitive manner. That has already started. In fact, uh, just 10 days ago, we've launched the industrial information system. It is a portal. It's a land bank availability of India. If you go onto our website, investindia.gov.in, IN, you can go on to that portal and see where land is available. And you can click onto that plot and see the dimensions of that plot and what else is around that plot. And we are also bringing it to the point where you will be able to apply to the government to get that plot. That sense of transparency which is being brought about by the digitization and this entire effort of the government is created a very strong basis for us to move from that inflection point on a very fast rate of growth. And right. what is the other element which is bringing for us COVID, if I may just end on this one, is that you remember leapfrogging was always a concept which was attached to India. We did that so well in the telecom industry. What is now happening with this entire digitization and these move policy incentives and plans which are happening both at the state and the government level, and this focus on getting industry going in that Atmodhya is our ability to leapfrog virtually in each and every sector and work on our strengths to make that happen. Let me give you an example. 48 months ago, 
India was rated about 122 or 123 in global rankings on per capita data consumption. And we all agree data is the new oil that is going to be propelling the growth of all these countries going forward in economies like ours or any other economy on the planet. You know what was our ranking late last year? We were number one in the world. India today consumes more per capita mobile data than the US and China put together. And I'm yeah. not talking of total data, I'm saying per capita, to be fair to any other country and economy. That is the manner in which we are leapfrogging. And that foundation stone laid on the strength of our digitization and the second brick of the uh, policy measures being announced both at the state and the central level are going to take us back to my earlier pillar, which I mentioned of being one of the largest, fastest growing economies on the planet to take, go back to that position in a very fast manner the moment we are out of this virus. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Bagla, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, insights uh, and and putting things in perspective. It, uh, I mean, things definitely sound uh, far more encouraging than perhaps uh, when we started out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Govind.